don't know about you, but there's been multiple times in my life when I've been stranded with a dead battery. It feels helpless. You turn the key over and over and nothing happens. You know, our faith can get drained just like that battery. If you want your charge, stay with me. That's today. Welcome to this edition of Living on the Edge with Chip and Griffin. The mission of these daily programs is to intentionally disciple Christians through the Bible teaching of Chip Ingram. And today we're diving into his popular series, Momentum, How to Ignite Your Faith. For the next several programs, Chip's gonna walk through a handful of familiar Bible figures whose character and faith give us a clear picture of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But before we get going, to help you get the most out of this series, let me encourage you to download Chip's message notes they contain his outline, scripture references, and much more. You can get them under the broadcasts tab at livingontheedge.org. App listeners tap fill in notes. Okay, if you're ready, go to Romans chapter 12 in your Bible as we kick off this series with Chip's message, What is True Spirituality? I'm going to ask you to kind of reach back in the recesses of your mind, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to think back to either the very first or the most memorable spiritual experience you had as a young child? When were you most aware that, that there was a God, that there's something more than yourself, this sense that God existed and maybe even that he cared for you, whoever or whatever this was going to be like? Have you got it? Really try and think back. Sort of that first kind of God experience, awareness that, you know, there's more than just the material world. For me, I was uh, eight years old. I still remember it vividly. I'm eight years old, and I was the altar boy, and I'm carrying this cross, and the pastor's behind me, and a bunch of other people, and, and I came, at our church was a big A-frame, and I don't know, about 40 feet high, and it was all stained glass with a cross in the middle, and, you know, I put the little cross over here, and he'd go this way, and I'd go this way, and, and I sat, and that particular day, light was coming through the stained glass, and it hit just the base of the cross, you know, I'm just a squirrely eight-year-old, and I don't have any theological training, and I don't know anything. But I, I had thoughts go through my mind that I never had my whole life. It was like, wow, I wonder what God's like. You know, if he made everything, I wonder, I wonder what he wants me to do. I wonder how you know him. And, and all I can tell you is I had this, this warm feeling of love and acceptance that vaguely said it has something to do with that cross. And all I can, you know, you're an eight-year-old kid, so I, I, you know, I get done, and I don't know what the pastor said. I was just a kid. And, but I told my mom and dad, I want to be the altar boy every week from now on at 8 o'clock. I mean, so, there was this drawing. There was this sense of warmth and love, and it was, what it was was God's presence. I'd never experienced it before. And I was being, I didn't, looking back, I was being wooed by the Holy Spirit, and I experienced God's presence, and so I wanted it again. That's what happens when you really experience God. And, and the bad part was my spiritual experience only lasted less than seven days because I remember the next week I told my parents, I didn't want to get up. It was kind of early, you know, 8 o'clock, and, <laughs> and like it was really cool last week, but, you know, and... And so uh, I continued to, to go to church, and the denomination I came out of has some very good Bible-teaching, wonderful people. Mine wasn't one of those. And so as I grew up, I, that was my experience, and then I, I grew up in a place where people, it was filled with being irrelevant, hypocritical, everyone saying certain things, acting certain ways, but their walk and their talk told a completely different message. And then I guess I was naive that when they said stuff, I thought at least someone meant it, but there was zero expectation that anything that anyone said on Sunday would have anything to do with how you lived. And so I kind of watched this, and I'm a fairly logical guy, so by about 16, I kind of came to this conclusion. I think church and the whole God stuff is about adults creating religion to keep your kids, like, in line morally, you know, for a few years so you don't get totally whacked out. And then, you know, when you get to be an adult like the rest of us, you learn there is no Santa Claus, no Easter Bunny, and no God. But it's just sort of this sociological thing to keep them from, you know, doing terrible bad things growing up and control them. And so I just at 16 said, I don't know where life and purpose is coming from, but it certainly isn't God, it's certainly not the church, and, you know, maybe somebody created all this. I don't know, I don't have time for it. You know, you're 16, what do you think about? And so I, I kind of went through, okay, so where's meaning and purpose in life going to come from? 
And uh, I grew up in the, you know, the 60s and then early 70s was hitting adulthood. And my dad was a very focused guy. He was a Marine. I, I used to say he was an ex-Marine. And after I said that in a talk, a guy came up to me and said, excuse me, young man, there's no such thing as an ex-Marine. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> And, uh, and honestly, I, I learned that when my father was, uh, went home to be with the Lord, the Marines came, and they were a part of that service and folded a flag and gave it to me. He was a Guam, Iwo Jima, Purple Heart guy. But um, my dad had this very strong, like, if, if he said it, you just didn't mess with him. And so it was like, look, son, here's how life works. You want to be happy? Yeah. They need to be successful. Okay, you want to be successful? You set clear goals, you develop a strategy, and you work harder than anyone else. You got that? Yes, sir. And so, I mean, I was like, okay. So I was that kid who was shoveling snow off the driveway in the middle of winter, you know, because I was going to shoot while other people were watching games. So eight or nine hours a day, I'm playing basketball. And then I figure it probably has something to do with money and academics. So I worked hard in school and uh, if you can become a workaholic at 12 or 13, I figured it out. I had my own lawn business, six or seven regular jobs, one all-day job, two paper outs, lent my parents $3,000 at 6% interest <laughs> so they could buy a little piece of land. And, so, and then when I got to high school, it was just like, you know, lock and load. Okay, you want to academically be here, you got to date a cute cheerleader, get a scholarship to college, be all this and all that. Now, I didn't get it all done, but basically when I got to be a senior... You know, had all those little check marks, and, you know, high school's not a really big fish pond, but when you're in it, you think it's pretty big stuff. And so I got my scholarship and did well and had the cute little cheerleader, and I'll never forget the graduation night. I was, uh, I don't know why, I can never remember why, but we were in this apartment, and it was completely empty. It didn't have any furniture, and there's 30 or 40 of us sitting in a circle, this is the 70s, okay, passing a joint around and reminiscing. And I didn't inhale. Not only actually, <laughs> that's a joke for some of you that remember years back. Uh, actually, I did not only didn't inhale, when you're, when you're on a basketball scholarship and you're my size and as skinny as I am, you can't put anything in your body that's going to hurt you. You know, I'm thinking, you know, so I just pass it on. And, and so no religious conviction. And I just thought, you know what? Everyone's bigger, stronger, and can jump higher than me. I better not mess myself up. And so this gal turns to me that was a good friend. She goes, Chip, you must be really happy tonight. And I said, why? And she started to peel off this cute little girlfriend, and, you know, you did well in school and got the scholarship. And, and I had this emotion of the most empty feeling at 18 I'd ever experienced in my life. And, and I realized someone just shattered my little box. It was, wait a second, happiness is by success. Success is you do this, 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 this. I followed the plan and I just felt this like, so this is it? And, and what's bad is I didn't even celebrate. I mean, I didn't even recognize that I'd sort of hit the goals. I had already, like some of us do, gone to the next one. I'd already decided, I'm going to go to college. I'm majoring in political science. I will be a lawyer. I will marry a beautiful wife. We'll have three beautiful kids. We'll have an Irish setter. <laughs> I will have a luxury car. I will wear, back then, a two or 300 Armani or Brooks Brothers suit. It was pretty cool. I'll live in the suburbs, and I'll be a leader in the community by the age 32 to 34. And it was just like, lock and load, go do it. And then I had this moment of like, now wait a second. I did this once. I could go do that and spend the next 15 years. What if I feel even more empty? And I'll never forget driving home, and then later that night, having, I'd say, a sort of a God talk. And my prayer was, God, if you exist, reveal yourself to me. I, I don't know if you do or not, but if you do and you're powerful enough and can reveal yourself to me, I want to know you. And if there's a purpose in life, I'd like to know what it is. A week later, a coach paid my way to a fellowship, a Christian athletes camp, and it was uh, actually a scary experience. I walked in, I got a t-shirt, this uh, little easy to read Bible, and I just thought I'd land in Jesus freak land. I mean, people would say the word Jesus out loud. They would talk about God and their professional athletes and college athletes and about 700 high school athletes. And Tom Landry came, so I thought, well, it can't be that bad. You know, he's the coach of the Cowboys. And, but I mean, it was like, oh, I mean, this is like 1972 and the Jesus movement. And I just thought, get me out of here. I can't take this for a week. 
And every morning, they, they give you this little Bible, and there's like 20 minutes you're supposed to read the Bible before you do calisthenics and then eat breakfast. Now, all day was fun. You played sports and got to talk with some guys. And so I just thought, they're not going to indoctrinate me. And so I wouldn't open it up. And after about um, the third day, there was such an authenticity and a reality and a love of these men that I thought, you know, maybe there's something to this. And the fast forward of the story is I realized that um, I had confused religion and Christianity with Jesus and a relationship with God. And I had rejected one and rejected the other, not knowing that they're very different. And that night, for the first time, I understood that God cared about me, that he sent his son, Jesus, who was fully God and fully man, to die upon a cross to pay for my sin, and that I could turn from my sin and receive a free gift, and literally, the Spirit of God would enter my human body and begin a transformation that's called eternal life, that sets you on a new course and brings peace and fills that emptiness in your heart and life. And uh, I, I prayed a very untheological, you know, dear God, whatever it means for you to come into my life, and I'm sorry for stuff I've done. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a pretty prayer, but I really meant it. And I knew that I couldn't play games with God, and I didn't want to be a hypocrite. And so there's a couple things, you know, I remember that night just thinking, boy, if I go down this road, I, gotta, I can't play around. And I remember asking Christ to come into my life and forgive me. And I like to say that then someone followed me up and taught me all these things and everything went great. All I can tell you is I went home and I took that little Bible and I stuck it under my pillow because I thought my parents might think I freaked out, you know. I mean, they were religious, but we didn't talk about God and we didn't pray. And I mean, they were good moral people. And all I can tell you is my desire started changing. And there was joy, and I found myself singing, and, and, and it was like, whoa, and this is great, you know, and, and, and just desires changed. And so I, I went away to college, and, and it was really neat. Like some of the really big sins were, bam, they're out of here. And it's like, whoa, this is awesome. But then I kind of found some other sins that were like, whoa, these don't go away so quickly. And, and then I started reading. I couldn't get enough of the Bible. I'd read it at night, read it in the morning. And as I was reading it, I'm in this college, and I'm playing on the basketball team, and there's four girls to every guy, and there's sort of a way to live that looks like really fun that, and I'm reading this New Testament that's saying, this is not God's way. And I didn't mind him forgiving my sins, but this running my life stuff was, I didn't really sign, you know. So how I was living and how God wanted me to live was like this. And this bricklayer came down who was trained by a group called the Navigators, and he helped me actually start to read the Bible so I could understand it and talk to God. And I was, I was having these little God experiences like when I was a little kid, like every day. And then on Thursday nights, all these kids would get together. Remember, this is the 70s and sitting on the floor and playing the guitars and singing. And the presence of God, I got it again. It was like, whoa, whoa, this is really cool. But it was like, I grew up thinking, you know, like if you, like seven out of 10 commands is like 70%. Isn't that like passing? I mean, that's a C, right? And I kept reading. It was like, you know, no, it's sort of like, and so I, I developed the schizophrenic Christianity. Read the Bible maybe two or three times a week in the morning and meet with God, and Thursday nights were fun. And then I got in a car with four or five basketball players every Friday and Saturday night, and we'd hit every bar in Wheeling. And then I felt really bad. God, I'm really sorry. I'm, oh, gosh, I, I know I, should, I shouldn't have said this, shouldn't have done this. I'm really sorry. Will you please forgive me? He forgive me, and I'm going to get and read my Bible tomorrow. In fact, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, but I'll even try and get and go to church. I'm really, I'm really sorry. <laughs> you know, and oh, thank you so much. And then... I mean, I was like nuts. You want, to, you want to something? Maybe not to that degree, but all the research says nine out of every ten Christians in America is living a Christian schizophrenic life. They intellectually adhere to I love Jesus. I've asked him to come in my life, in my heart. I think these things are really important. Of course, my finances, my future, my relationships, my mouth, my priorities don't show it. But, I mean, he grades on the curve, right? And I've never really met anyone who's really actually. And so I think I'm kind of. And, and so there's this life. And it's usually filled with lots of guilt and lots of duty. And you're supposed to do more of this and less of that. And, and then so what happens is you try hard and you fail. And you really want to be authentic. So you try really, really harder and you fail again. And then you realize, you know, forget it. You start just trying hard or not trying so hard. And then you fake it. And you learn a few verses and you smile. And, you know, you know let a praise the Lord come out in some groups. And let a, something else come out of your mouth in a different group. That's Christianity in America. 
See, what I, what I experienced is I, I, couldn't, I couldn't enjoy God's presence because I had all this guilt. And then I knew I was really a part of his family because I couldn't enjoy the sin anymore because I had all this shame and conviction. You're listening to Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. We'll return you to Chip's message in just a minute. But first, let me tell you, God is doing incredible work through this ministry all around the world. And if you'd like to join us, consider partnering with us during our mid-year match. Every gift we receive until midnight July 9th will be matched dollar for dollar. Join us today by going to livingontheedge.org or call 888-333-6003. We appreciate your generosity. Well, with that, here again is Chip. Here's the question. What is true spirituality? How do we move beyond religion, church programs, legalism, performance orientation, or in my case, a compartmentalized life? I had basketball, girls, and academics over here, and God and a few other things over here. How do we move beyond that to grace-filled, authentic relationship with God? That's what this whole series is about. What is true spirituality? There's three things you're going to have to understand if you are going to experience it. And here's what I want to tell you. That moment as an eight-year-old or that moment that came to your mind when you had a God awareness, when there was a sense of warmth and acceptance and love, and there was something outside yourself that maybe there's meaning to life, God wants you to experience that 24-7. But it starts, are you ready? True spirituality begins with an accurate picture of God. You have to have an accurate picture of God. If you have a warped picture of God, it will send you down bad pathways. If you think God is an angry deity that you're afraid of, that he's always looking to punish you, it'll send you into ritual. So you do so many things a day, and you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you have to do that, and you hope someday, some way, that you can appease his anger. Or for others, you think God is a a cosmic scorekeeper. And he's got this great board, you know, chalkboard in the sky, and there's a chalk line in the middle, good deeds and bad deeds, and, and your whole life is about good deed, good deed, good deed. I'm a good boy. Don't you love me today? Bad, you don't really serve us. Good girl, good girl, bad boy. And it's a performance orientation. And you never pray long enough or hard enough or good enough. You never give enough. You never measure up. And somehow then you start grading on the curve and you just hope somehow, some way, that the cosmic scorekeeper, that maybe your good deeds will outweigh your bad deeds realizing that you totally miss relationship. For others, you think, or have been taught, or at least the worldview is out there, is that he's not an angry deity. He's not even a cosmic scorekeeper. He is an impersonal force. God is an invisible, impersonal force. He is in and all all things, and even inside of you in some ways. And you need to become one with the universe. And so there's a formula. I'm serious. So the formula is an altered state of consciousness. The formula is techniques and ways to develop oneness with the cosmos. I'm going to tell you, God is not an angry deity. He is not a cosmic scorekeeper. And he's far from an impersonal force. He's your heavenly father. He loves you. But he's a father. You matter. He wants a relationship. He wants to, in ways that are very visceral and real, he wants to hug you and hold you and love you and direct you and guide you and, like any parent, give you the very best. The Apostle John would write, 1 John 3, 1, How great is the love of the Father. He's lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it does not know him. Jesus' life was a complete contradiction to all the religion of his day. His harshest words came to people that kept all the rules, that were squeaky clean, that did all the religious activities. And he, in their minds, broke through all those rules because he was about a relationship with the Father. And they watched, and the thing that that showed the intimacy more than anything else is his disciples. They'd they'd listen to him pray, and they'd watch him pray. And it wasn't duty, and it wasn't going through lists, and it wasn't to impress people like they saw growing up. And so they said, Lord, teach us to pray. What does he say? Your Father 
knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray, our Father, foreign concept. Judaism of the day had the sense of God's majesty and his glory and his transcendence, but they had missed the truth of scripture of his fatherhood, of his intimacy, of his approachability. And since God is your father, he has a dream. He's got a plan for your life. How many people, by the way, just are, are parents in here? You got a kid. Wow, awful lot of us. If you don't know this yet, it's only because they're real small. But your kids have a powerful, powerful uh, role to play in your life. They will be the source of greatest joy you will ever experience on this planet. And they will be the source of the greatest heartache you will ever have. Far more than any conflict with your mate, this person that's a part of each of you can break your heart, can, can break down communication, can say things and do things and live in ways that will bring you the deepest, deepest sorrow you'll ever experience. And by contrast, man, when your kids want to be around you, they, I, mean, is there, I mean, when they're little and they, they, Daddy, can I crawl up in your lap? Yeah. Daddy, what? I love you. Oh, God. You know, I mean, you're right? And I will tell you that even as they grow up and get older and have kids of their own, there's few things sweeter in all of life. And you have a dream for your kids, and I have a dream for my kids. And, and when you're young, like they're like one or two years old, and you're young parents, like, I want them to be a, an astronaut, a nuclear physicist. I want my son to, you know, cure cancer, or, you know, I want him to be the CEO of, and you have all these lofty what they do. And then they get to be like little kids and eight, nine, ten years old, and you're thinking, you know, I'd like him to be a nice boy, <laughs> nice girl. Then they get to be teenagers. I don't care what they do. I mean, they can deliver trash, but if they loved God, if they were a person of integrity, if they had character, if we had a great relationship, I could care less where they work. Oh, God, give them a good vocation, help them to put food on the table, put them in their gifts, but oh, God, what I really want See, what you're really concerned about, the older you get, is not what they do, but who they become. God's dream for you is about who you become. When you understand that he's father, God's dream for his children is to make you like his son. He's not a force. See, we, we got this idea that there's like these invisible rules or principles or duties, and when I violate those, oh, sorry, I messed up. No, 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 no. You broke your father's heart. You stepped away from relationship. You, you, you pulled away from his hug. He loves you. He cares for you. For reasons I don't understand, the one that created all that there is has given you the opportunity to either bring him joy or bring him sorrow. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. That's a personal word. When I live in ways that are not good for me, it hurts God's heart because he's my father. You miss that. You fall into religious activity, external rules. This is Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram, and you've been listening to part one of Chip's message, What is True Spirituality? from our series, Momentum. Chip will be back shortly to share some helpful application for us to think about. You've heard us say we are on a mission to help Christians everywhere live like Christians. And that's a great vision statement and goal, but how can we practically do that? In this series, Chip shows us the way by studying the lives of six well-known Bible characters. Discover what we can learn from people like Abraham, Moses, and Joseph, and how their attitudes and faith in God are helpful guides for us today. You're not going to want to miss a word of this meaningful series. Well, Chip's in studio with me now, and Chip, you wrapped up your talk today by saying God's dream for you is to make you like Jesus. And one of the best ways we can do that is by following the example of other strong, devoted believers, whether that's a parent, teacher, coach, or even a peer. So would you take a minute and talk about the people who had an impact on your spiritual journey? Absolutely, Dave. When I look back on the moments and the investments of people throughout my life, my sister, Punky, who modeled Jesus to me as a young teenager. You know, Dave, the bricklayer who sat with me in his kitchen table and invested his life in me as a young adult. Or Dick, a, a man who came to me and said, hey, Chip, um, we need to put this teaching that, of yours on the air. And he started living on the edge. Wherever we are in our journey, we're never beyond the need for discipleship. 
It might come through a, a listening ear or an encouraging word over a cup of coffee, or it might be one of those side-by-side side doing Bible study together. But it's always born in relationship, and it's deliberate. It's an investment into the life of another person. At Living on the Edge, we're committed to making that investment in helping people grow deeper in their relationship with Christ. And so whether it's teaching on the radio or podcasts or app or tools such as Daily Discipleship, our resources are geared to help people in every season of life. And here's my question. If God has used the ministry of Living on the Edge to guide or deepen your life or the life of someone that you love, would you be willing to pray about investing in a few ways? Number one, would you pass on what you know to someone else? Second, would you share ministry resources with others? I mean, we have all kind of free ministry resources on the web and on the Chip Ingram app. And third, would you pray about giving financially to the ministry so that we can continue to make disciples at a time when it's more needed than ever before? And right now, every gift that you would give will be doubled dollar for dollar. So thank you for pausing thinking, and praying about what God would want you to do. And if you will do whatever he shows you, we will have all we need to do all God's called us to do. Keep pressing ahead. Thanks, Chip. Well, if you believe God is calling you to join us in helping disciple Christians everywhere, now's a great time to become a financial partner because during our mid-year match, every dollar we receive will be doubled until midnight July 9th. To send a gift, call us at 888-333-6003 or go to livingontheedge.org. That's 888-333-6003 or visit livingontheedge.org. App listeners, tap donate. We'll hear again as Chip to share a few final words. As we close today's program, I just have a couple thoughts uh, that if we could have a cup of coffee, I would sort of lean back and look at you and I would say, you know, just be careful that you don't get bogged down in all the rituals in your faith. You know, it's so easy to turn the Christian life into something that's performance-based and Boy, I certainly have erred on that side of life in my world. I was, you know, how long did I pray and how many chapters? And I'm reading through the Bible in a year and I didn't get through the right chapters today. Or, you know, I, I said I would pray for X minutes, but I didn't do it. And, you know, I'm supposed to memorize these passages. And, you know, all those things are means. All those things are important. But we need to remember that our relationship with God is about a relationship. You know, Abraham took big steps of faith because in his heart of hearts, God became his father. He knew God would provide. He knew God would protect. It was a love and loyalty. And so I just want to encourage you as, you as you read your Bible, as you do good things, just be careful that, I don't want to overuse the cliche, but it can be checking a box. I had my quiet time. I prayed. I did this. I want to remind you that God is wild about you that he loves you, that he'd love to meet with you. And you cannot just, quote, do it in the morning or before bedtime. But he'd love to just hear you kind of talk in your mind or in the car, turn off the radio, and just share your life, share your heart, share your hurt, share your praise, and cultivate that relationship. You'll be really glad you did. Hmm. Thanks for that encouraging application, Chip. As we wrap up today's program, if you've been blessed by Chip's teaching and you'd like to bless others in the same way, let me encourage you again to partner with us financially. And right now is a great time because every dollar we receive between now and midnight, July 9th, will be matched dollar for dollar. To join the team, go to livingontheedge.org or call 888-333-6003. That's 888-333-6003 or visit livingontheedge.org. App listeners tap donate. Well, join us next time as Chip continues his series, Momentum. Until then, I'm Dave Drewy, thanking you for listening to this edition of Living on the Edge. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you'd like to watch more content like this, click and subscribe here to our channel. And by the way, if you'd like to know more about Living on the Edge, find out about more resources, maybe get on the mailing list, go to livingontheedge.org. See you next time.